Welcome to Business Pulse Talk Radio. I'm your host, Michael Brett. We've got an exciting show for you here today. We have uh, my friend and uh, client, uh, Luis Cota. He's with uh, Elite Beverage International, and he's going to be talking about their flagship product, uh, Tequila Commissario. Uh, before we get into that, I've got a couple of announcements that I do want to make. Um, first off, um, most of you probably know I've published uh, two books um, in my career. I'm still on Amazon.com. Writing my third book on raising capital for your business, kind of revised uh, with crowdfunding, 506C private placements, and also with a Reg A+. Plus. And I got into discussions with Forbes Publishing Company. Uh, the CEO, Adam Witte, uh, wants uh, Forbes to publish my uh, third book. So Forbes is, again, part of the Forbes magazine uh, empire, and uh, that will open up doors for uh, being a speaker at the Forbes conferences, Forbes radio, and all the things that go along with Forbes magazine. So I'm pretty excited about that. The other thing I want to mention real quickly is we're, uh, Business Pulse Talk Radio is going to be working with Network News Wire as the official podcast for their clients and for their network. Now, uh, why is that important? Well, let me, get, let me read first, because this just happened uh, a few days ago. Let me read what uh, Network Newswire does and why it's important to guests like Luis Cota or anybody that appears on Business Pulse Talk Radio. Network Newswire is a financial news and publishing company for uh, private and public companies. They are a financial news and content distribution company. They provide access to network wire services that reach targeted markets in all industries and demographics in a very effective manner. They write original articles and editorial syndication to over 5,000 news outlets. They do an enhanced press release service for maximum impact, and they've got nearly 2 million followers. Now, why is this important? Again, for guests that appear on our show and new clients that come to us, Network Newswire is a multifaceted organization that has an extensive team of contributing journalists and writers that help companies target investors, consumers, journalists, and the general public to provide visibility for products, recognition, and brand awareness. Now, that's why it's important because we've opened up now on Business Pulse Talk Radio with our host network, OC Talk Radio, a whole new avenue of exposure and brand awareness for our clients. So this is uh, going to be something that's going to start taking place in the next couple of weeks. It's, again, it's going to open up a worldwide network of an audience of potential investors and new consumers to help with brand awareness. So I'm pretty excited about it. I think it's really going to add a lot to the show. Get that commercial out of the way. Let's talk with my friend Luis Cota from uh, Elite Beverage International. Welcome. Good morning, Michael, and thank you for having me on board. Sure. Now, Luis has been on the show before. We've talked about um, tequila commissarial being the most awarded tequila around with double golds, silver. So it's got all the accolades that it needs, and it's established market distribution and a lot of networks. But it's a premium, ultra premium tequila, and Luis. Um, it's almost like a lifestyle beverage, if I could use that mm -hmm, phrase. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, a, it's a premium product. Uh, there's a wide uh, acceptance of premium products, mm -hmm, whether mm -hmm. they're Gucci handbags or, you know, Louis Vuitton or something along that line. And also it goes to the spirits market. Is that where you're positioning uh, tequila commissario? Very much so, Michael. And by the way, if I may digress for just one second before I answer your question, I've uh, Michael's become a great friend of ours and a great advisor of ours. But one of the things I admire about Michael is this whole left brain, right brain ability you have. <laughs> Not only does he have a wonderful show and he's a great business advisor for us and a good mentor, but he writes music. He sings. <laughs> he's incredible. I mean, I'm so envious. So kudos to you, Michael. <laughs> well, I like the title you gave me, Renaissance the Man. I, Rena I like that. Renaissance Man is exactly yeah, in, I like in, that. Indeed, indeed. Anyway, you're, you're so correct. I think that as we look at our culture, and America is the standard of the world, we're sort of the envy of the world in many ways, particularly in terms of the, the trends we set, the food we eat, the clothes, the things, and particularly out of California. So, yes, we are a trend-setting country, and yes, we're very aspirational in that respect, I think. And so whether it's, you know, you, we all want a Porsche or a Maserati or a Mercedes. We all like to drink Dom Perignon or Remy Martin. And I think tequila has become very much that, you know. In today's status-conscious world, when you look at what's important to people, ultra premium tequila, whether it's Don Patron or whether it's Don Julio or Tequila Comisario, is very much 
one of the categories that the world and the consumer wants to say, I belong in that world. So it's very much aspirational and very cultural for us, I think. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think <clears throat> tequila commissario, the ultimate ultra premium spirits, mm -hmm. it's probably recession proof, just like the mm -hmm. ultra, mm -hmm. you know, the luxury items that people yeah. buy. Mm -hmm. Uh, no matter how bad the economy gets, people always have money for, for beer, for mm -hmm. wines, and whatever. And I, I think they pay a premium price for these pr premium products. No doubt about it. I think many of us that enjoy, you know, food and wine, if you will, or food and spirits, if you will, and enjoy going out, we may cut back on, you know, large vacations or the new auto purchase, but we're not going to curtail our daily habits of a glass of wine or a cocktail after work um, with our friends. So it, it is very much research proof. People will, will drink to celebrate. And they'll drink to sort of drown their sorrows, if you will. <laughs> but they will drink. And so in that respect, we're very much recession-proof. And then, thank goodness, given the last two, three decades of tequila growth and its quality of being only 100% blue agave and only being from a certain uh, small place in Jalisco, Mexico, and that little place uh, could be compared to Champagne or Cognac or Napa, a very unique growing place, it has made tequila one of those really desired for products in the world, I think. you know. And the ultra premium product again like uh, tequila commissario mm -hmm. is is uh basically it's it's uh, you want to enjoy it mm -hmm. straight based mm -hmm. in, in a like a snifter as mm -hmm. opposed to yeah. mixing it mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. i understand that the the blanco the white tequila mm -hmm. was voted the number one tequila in the world for making margaritas and I understand from you, talking to you, that margarita is kind of the number one drink uh, here in the United States. That's correct. You know, talk about a uh, kind of a, a quiet control. People don't think about it. We all think about drinking a cosmopolitan or a gin and tonic or a vodka on the rocks. But in fact, margaritas are the number one consumed drink in America in terms of a cocktail by far, far and away. So, yes, it is. And to that point, uh, tequila is very versatile. You know, the Blanco, certainly, which is pure agave spirit and has this wonderful, beautifully kind of earthy, paper, uh, earthy peppery, spicy flavor to it that adds complexity to the drink when you add citrus and you add, you know, uh, um, Grand Manier, whatever you put in your mixed drink, it really complements that very well. But on the other hand, our aged expressions of Reposado and Añejo compare very well uh, in terms of their complexity to what the global drinker of brown spirits. If you like drinking single malt scotches or Japanese whiskeys or bourbons from you know, Kentucky and Tennessee and so on, then um, our brown spirits compare very favorably with us. Very complex, very well made indeed. You know? what, what are the margins um since it does sell for a premium price, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. are the margins for your company higher mm -hmm. than it would be if it was a cheaper type of vodka? Very much so, very much so. When you look at, uh, at the leading spirits categories in America, vodka, gin, rum, cognac, uh, and tequila, and you would rank them in terms of profitability at all levels, from the brand owner to the wholesaler to the, to the retailer or restaurateur, tequila is number one. By far and away is the number one profit generator at all levels uh, in terms of the, the different segments. Uh, vodka is the lowest level, ironically enough. Now, <laughs> it is the biggest category. I mean, we are a, tequila is today a 38 million case category in America. Vodka is like at 75 million cases in America, so it's twice our size. We are probably the third or fourth highest case category in growing, outgrowing all the other ones. We've passed rum, we've passed gin, we've passed whiskey, we've passed scotch whiskeys, passed uh, Canadian whiskey, as a category, whiskey overall, when you include all the different worlds, uh, countries of the world, it's still a bigger category. But so we're growing very rapidly at a very, very high margin. I mean, we're talking triple quantities in terms of um, uh, margins for uh, importers and for wholesalers and so on. So it's very, very healthy. So it, vodka is uh, a larger category, if I understand you. It's a larger category, but mm -hmm. their profits are smaller? Correct, correct. I mean, it's become a very competitive category. When you look at brands like Smyrna Vodka, which is owned by Diageo, um, you know, they get retail pricing that is $9.99, $12.99, $14.99. So at that kind of a retail price, but even if you're making 25, 30%, you're still talking like three or $4 a bottle profit, but there's huge volume there. So when you look at something like us or Patron or Casamigos, that we're looking at retail prices of $65 for our Añejo, 55 for Reposado and 45 for our Blanco, there's pretty healthy margins in there for the, for the distributor, retailer and the, in, the importer. Mm -hmm. Now our show is uh, about helping businesses grow, mm -hmm. get uh, investors, how to present, how to raise capital. Mm -hmm. What if somebody's listening to the show now and say, geez, I'd like, I like to start a spirits company. I'd like to get into the tequila, mm -hmm. vodka. Mm -hmm. is, is it a space that's 
easy to get into? Mm -hmm. And and if not, what is required for somebody to get a a spirit Mm -hmm. developed, Mm -hmm. get it to market? Um, Lots of money. (laughs) (laughs) Is distribution distribution the key as well as marketing? But you you really need distribution. So it's it's an interesting world because it's it's a fascinating uh, world to be in, the the spirits and wine world. Once you get into it, it becomes a wonderful addiction. I've been blessed. I came out of college in 1973 or 4, and I went right to work for the Gallo Winery, then Diageo, then different companies uh, throughout uh, America. And so I've been very blessed to learn both sides of it. The, the supplier side and the distributor side. So it's a very complex world in that uh, the federal government and the states all control what happens. So we've got 51, 50 states and, you know, and Colombia and so on, District Columbia, that have their own sets of laws. So it's like dealing with 51 different countries, number one, for regulations and laws. You know, Utah is, is a state retailer in Utah. Pennsylvania controls sales of it. California is very liberal, so you can go to the 7-Eleven or you can go to CVS or you can go to any grocery store and be able to buy spirits or wines. So it's it's very complex in that respect, and as the business becomes bigger and bigger, and it's an incredibly good business to be in because, as we said, it's recession-proof and it's very profitable, there's been a huge amount of consolidation in terms of the wholesale uh, tier and the producer, importer, brand owner tier. So you've got half a dozen companies that control a huge amount of sales globally. Pernod Ricard, Diageo, Brown Foreman, um, Jim Beam, Suntory, a uh, Jim Beam, a Kentucky whiskey owned by a Japanese company. I mean, so the consol- <laughs> consolidation and and, uh, and acquisitions have been tremendous in our business. And then the same way by distributors, uh, we've got a company called Solomon Spirits, who's now in 44 states. Um, Young's RNDC have just merged. They'll be in 32 states. So this is huge consolidation. So they have massive networks, warehousing and trucking and sales forces. And so what is happening in our business, a lot of the little small startup companies are finding it hard to get into those environments because they've already carried thousands of brands in SKU, so it's becoming challenging to do so. And so there's a challenge in saying, I've got this creative new concept, it's a wonderful product, how do I get it distributed through the channels properly? And and if you've got something, you know, if you're George Clooney, for example, right. and you create your own little tequila at your place in Cabo San Lucas, and you're <laughs> world famous, you will get a billion dollars for it. Um, so there's an opportunity to, if you're creative, if you're quality-minded, if you're in the right category, and you feel in mind working really, really, really hard. I mean, we are an overnight seven-year you know, yeah. success story. You know? <laughs> so it does happen. It's a fascinating business, but it requires an awful lot of work and it requires an awful lot of advice because you've got a very competitive segment. You've got tremendous loss and regulations and you've got to have very good financial backing because it takes, in our case, as you will know, here we are seven years later, we finally found the right backing. We had the right inventory from one, from 18 months ago to today, we're in about 30 states now. So we're growing rapidly and because everything finally lined up for us. You know? I, I'm not sure, you know, uh, how about you know about the craft beer market as mm-hmm. it compared mm-hmm. to the spirits mm-hmm. market? Mm-hmm. But I, I think the craft beers are trying to, you know, they've been for the mm-hmm. last several years very mm-hmm. popular, but I think they're coming down mm-hmm. in popularity mm-hmm. and it's getting a tougher mm-hmm. market mm-hmm. for craft beers, mm-hmm. uh, even though uh, I guess they sell for a higher price. I'm not really a beer drinker mm-hmm. that much, but I guess they sell for a higher mm-hmm. price retail than in the bars also. Do you see that as a shift between? People not drinking as much craft beer and switching more to a premium mm-hmm. tequila product? Yeah. I think that it's perhaps somewhat cyclical. You know, 20 years ago, uh, 25 years ago, wine was skyrocketing, and it became 35 30% of the business. Then the last 10 years or so, craft beers grew dramatically, you know. And one of the issues with them is this, you know, on overabundance of brands, if you will. So there's, there's a shakeout going on. And by the way, there's a company called Constellation Brands that is like the third biggest globally. They paid $1 billion for Lagunitas IPA, that brand. So, you know, there's money to be made there if you've got the right, right. if you're in the right spot and you make the right uh, buzz, you can get purchased by a mega giant and, you know, say goodbye world, I'm done. <laughs> um, but um, so right now, I mean, uh, spirits lately have been growing dramatically in the last decade or so because we as Americans have discovered the great complexity and nuances of brown spirits you know when you look at vodka vodka is meant to be a great mixer because it is literally tasteless colorless and odorless so it mixes with everything now we're seeing all these flavors of vodka whatever on the other hand brown spirits that are barrel aged that come from different parts of the world that are you know peaty or that are spicy because of agave or that are you know uh, japanese whiskeys with their uh, their little nuances great complexities and they all are all barrel aged so brown spirits offer the consumer a great taste sensation so yes there's again that um, that um, 
desire to enjoy what's best of the world. But to your earlier comment, yes, uh, beers, I think, uh, are there's going to, there's a shakeout going on. I mean, a lot of the big brewers, whether it's Budweiser or you know uh, Coors or Molson, they're all acquiring these little tiny brands because that's what the consumer's still enjoying. And the same thing for us. I mean, you look at our world. I think all of us recognize. Uh, Cuervo and Sousa and Patron and Casamigos and Don Julio as major brands. But if you were to look at the CRT, which is the Regulatory Council in Mexico, there's nearly 2,000 brands of tequila registered uh, in, in Mexico. There's 195 distilleries. So there's a huge amount of people that are saying, oh, I'm going to make my own tequila. And 98% of them don't ever make it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, earlier before we started the show, we were talking about cannabis mm -hmm. and uh, I'm getting emails uh, weekly from com mm -hmm. companies that want to infuse mm -hmm. wine mm -hmm. and cannabis mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. uh, have you thought about uh, cannabis infused tequila? Very much so. Uh, very, it's just an evolution. And like I mentioned a bit ago, you know, we are, we are regulated by the federal government to bring our product in. So it has to be approved by the federal government, analysis and label approval, and all that kind of stuff. Once you satisfy that, then you get to the state level and they've got to make sure that you're approved and licensed in each state. And then the third leg to this, because we are a product that is produced in Mexico, then we have to have the state, the country of Mexico approved infusions. And they're dabbling with it in Mexico. Mexico is a much more conservative country, highly Catholic and so on. So they're not dabbling with legalizing marijuana because you're getting the same pressure from Canada and the U.S. as part of the North American Treaty. So they are going to legalize it eventually, and they're, after that step, they're going to allow you know, CBD, cannabis, and infusions into, the, into Mexican goods, whether it's you know, beers or mezcal or tequila. It'll happen, but they'll be the slowest of the three countries to proceed that way. We, basically, you have to wait until it's legal on the federal level before mm -hmm. you could even uh, put a product out with that's infused with the cannabis. Correct. If I understand that, yeah, correct. okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. great. Um, what do you see a market for the premium style tequilas uh, with infused cannabis in it, or do you think people would enjoy the tequila just you know by itself, you mm -hmm. know, without mm -hmm. the cannabis yeah. infusion? Have you studied that particular? Yeah, scenario? I think I think that there will be a very good market. I think that as we educate consumers into the benefits of CBD and its medical benefits and its uh, you know and its non THC, non mind altering side of it, I think CBD and cannabis will be a huge part of how us as consumers in America use it. I mean, I got home last night and I put a little CBD ointment on my lower back because I've got a, I've got a horrible back, you know. And While well, you, know, you were taking a drink of tequila, right? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> well, it, it happened to be a glass of wine, but yes. Yeah. So I think that obviously you have, to do the, you have to do the infusion in a way that it does not affect the primary flavor of tequila. That You maintain that beautifully agave, pepper, spice, earthiness, that on the age expressions you get the oak coming through. So all of that has to happen. Uh, and then when you add the CBD infusion, that it doesn't alter that state, that taste. And you're talking about infusing the CBD um, in as a basically a, a health benefit as opposed mm -hmm. to getting you higher, like with the Correct. THC. So mm -hmm. uh, if I understand correctly, you know, the market as far as alcohol and cannabis mm -hmm. would be not to infuse the alcohol with THC, mm -hmm. which gets you mm -hmm. much, much mm -hmm. higher. Mm -hmm but to keep mm -hmm. the CBD into yeah. the product. Is that I think th I think that's the major benefit of it all. Yes, the, uh, the, the potential benefits at all. Now, having said that, there are people that are going to infuse people, um, infuse uh, alcoholic beverages with THC and hemp. Uh, so that will happen also. There's going to be a segment of that. You know, it's like, you know, kids went through this phase of drinking vodka and Red Bull. Well, you know, you're taking this energy <laughs> drink and that alcohol to it just blows you up emotionally and physically. So there will be some of that market, I think. But the majority is going to be, I think, looking at the benefits of what the CBD can do, I think. you know. And I've read some studies where um, people, I guess the millennials or the younger, so-called younger generation, mm -hmm. are not drinking as much. Mm -hmm. But when they do drink... They they want the higher type premium mm -hmm. uh, products, you mm -hmm. know, like uh, yeah. tequila commissario. Mm -hmm. How do you think that would affect, um, again, the CBD going mm -hmm. into the product? Do you mm -hmm. think the, that would bring a bigger audience mm -hmm. in through mm -hmm. the millennials that don't really want to partake of alcohol that much, but mm -hmm. you kind of mm -hmm. like the, uh, the the cannabis yeah, aspect? Yeah, very much so. I think that's a great question you've asked. I think the, we use the word in our industry pre premiumization. You know, when we were kids, we used to drink quarter for nine ninety nine. Now we don't think twice about paying sixty five, seventy dollars for a bottle of tequila or cognac or whiskey. You know, so we've become uh, inured to 
buying things that are much better, whether it's in our clothing, our food, and what we drink. So premiumization is a huge part of our culture. So yeah, I think that that um, when it comes to, and, and you mentioned millennials, you know, here we've got a, uh, a segment of demographics that are very aware, very connected, and fairly well to do. So I think that that's going to be a huge part of it, that they're less brand conscious and more aware of what potential status brands, however boutique they may be, or small they may be, or small batch, or craft may be, that they're going to be looking for that on an ongoing basis. Yes. You're listening to Business Pulse Talk Radio. I'm your host, Michael Brett. Uh, Business Pulse Radio is the heartbeat of business. I have my very special guest and friend, Luis Cota. He's the president of Elite Beverage International, and we've been talking about their flagship product, Tequila Commissario. And Luis, before we've got maybe another five minutes or so, six minutes, Give us some of your, your contact information, your email address, the website, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, so people can mm-hmm. kind of get in touch if they want to get additional information. By all means, Michael. Our website is www.tequilacomisario.com. Uh, my personal email is luis, L-U-I-S, luis at elitebeverage.com. Uh, feel free to call me, 949 697 1512 is my cell phone. Uh, always available, always enjoy talking to new people. So, by all means, get in touch with us. We'd love to. If, if uh, we, t- I know we touched on this just earlier about mm-hmm. startups. If somebody's thinking about mm-hmm. starting a business mm-hmm. with spirits, are you? Um, I know there's a lot of talk out there about mentors and things of that nature. If you were to get a call from somebody that wants to get another spirit, not a competitor, mm-hmm. but somebody, you know, maybe in a whiskey or, or some other type mm-hmm. of product, mm-hmm. but wants to tap into your knowledge, into your um, network of distribution mm-hmm. and things of that nature. Is that something you might consider? I know you wouldn't do it for free, as some mentors do, but is that something you might consider if you get a phone call or email from from one of our listeners? No, I would love to. Uh, I was fortunate enough to have had a number of mentors in my career, and I could mention some names from Napa Valley that are luminaries that helped me when I was a young man. Robert Mondavi, Andre Chalichev, Brother Tim, Tom Eddy. So I was blessed to receive that kind of that kind of uh, sage advice. I'd be happy to. To pass it on, I think it only makes sense to do that and and uh, pay back a little bit of what we've all been so lucky to be to have gotten. What What are the future plans moving forward? Now mm-hmm. we've we've kind of you know touched on uh, you know where uh, Tequila mm-hmm. Commissario mm-hmm. Elite Beverage you know mm-hmm. has made a footprint. The next two, three, four, five years, where do you see the company going, and and how are you going to get there? Well, you know, it's interesting. I mentioned earlier that we're in just about 30 states now, almost. Uh, We were lacking only one big state in the country, which is Texas, and that was just because of a merger going on with a couple of distributors. So that should be solved quickly. But as we have a footprint with distributors and across the country, what I would like to make sure that we do is what are the hot categories in our industry, if you will, or in beverages that are similar to ours that can be sold through our current distributor network. So for example, I'm in discussions today with a small Kentucky distillery. I'm about to buy five to 10 whiskey barrels and create our very own whiskey label. You know, and I'm going to have it aged properly. We'll have some certain different variations and so on. So we're going to do that in the next year or two. Um, I'm working on two mezcals. Mezcal is like the little baby brother of tequila. It's just a, the same. It's a different agave, and it's a bit smokier. But I'm going to have two different mezcals, one from Oaxaca, which is the tradition where it all started, and one from Durango. So I'm looking at additional beverages that uh, uh, I think would be a good fit with our people, our status, and our direction with the distributor network that we have. So. And I know you, one of the products you do have is Sensei Wine. Mm-hmm. Um, how is that product moving, and, and what are the plans uh, to, to develop that more? It's doing very well. As a matter of fact, I just met with Massimo Sensi, the owner, in Boston about two weeks ago, and we've agreed on a direction to take for their brands. Uh, he was very impressed by what we've achieved with uh, Tequila Comisario, and he said to me, Luis, why can't we do the same thing for Sensi that we did for Comisario? I said, we can, but you just got to spend money. <laughs> <laughs> and so we've agreed on a, on a direction that is you know, financially stable. I'm not going to be crazy, but we talk about a lot of event marketing. You know, We're tied into MGM, T-Mobile Arena, New Orleans Arena. We're dealing with uh, Costco. We're dealing with a lot of different things that are kind of big brand oriented and I think it's very successful so I'm going to take them in that same direction they have some beautiful brands Uh, they have a Prosecco that is incredibly sexy and Prosecco which is the Italy's version of champagne, if you will, is in, is, has already bypassed champagne in consumption in America. So they've got some great brands at a great value. I mean, their Prosecco, which is very sexy and beautiful, is at 19.99 retail. And they have a selection of like Chiantis and Chardonnays and Cabernets and Merlots that are 12.99, 14.99. So great value to the consumer. So that brand, I think, has great potential. Is it the plan for uh, Elite Beverage International to make an acquisition mm-hmm. of Sensei and mm-hmm. 
bring it in as a wholly owned subsidiary? Yes, very much. So their, their current importer out of Boston, uh, uh, who's become a good friend of ours, and we met Sensi through him, has uh, thinking about retiring, and we're in discussions to acquire his company and therefore acquire the rights you know, in North America for Sensi. So that may well happen here in the next few months, very much so. This uh, you mentioned North America, and I, I want to get into that just for a minute. Mm -hmm. um, is is this whole premium, uh, ultra premium, uh, alcohol adult beverage product? Is it primarily North American uh, centered, or is it a worldwide mm -hmm. phenomenon for people? No, it's very much of a global phenomenon. I think you know, as as first world countries. Um, uh, become more and more uh, successful, and as countries like China become more consumer-minded, and the same thing with Russia, for example. So you, the number of countries that are in, quote-unquote, the first tier continues to grow, and all of these countries, whether it's more cars or more champagne or more Bordeaux and more spirits, is growing dramatically. So, no, we're going to see this happening across the world. And I mean, Diageo is the world's largest spirits company, and they paid a billion dollars for Casa Amigos. Bacardi paid a total of $5 billion for Patron. And they didn't just pay it because they wanted to waste money. They see the potential um, opportunity to take these tequilas into their global network of 190, dif 190 different countries that carry their other products. So, yeah, it's going to happen. You're listening to Business Pulse Talk Radio. I'm your host, I'm Michael Brett. Business Pulse Radio is the heartbeat of business. Our very special guest is Luis Cota from Elite Beverage International. And their, their flagship product, which we have some samples here on the table, uh, is Tequila Commissario. Give us the website again and your email address and phone number because we're getting ready to sign off. It's www.tequilacomissario.com. And my personal email is luis, L-U-I-S, at elitebeverage.com. Good. Mm -hmm. uh, again, uh, I want to thank Luis for being on the show. It's mm -hmm. one of the most awarded tequilas uh, out there. We have a little sheet here that talks about mm -hmm. the double gold they won and, mm -hmm. and and again these standards that uh, in order for you to get double gold and silver mm -hmm. and um we've talked about it on other shows but it's not just you know paying for it mm -hmm. you know you don't give somebody an envelope of cash under the table and they give you the award it's something you really have to work for and you really have to earn it's all about the quality in the bottle the process that we go through from <laughs> the aged agave to the kind of barrels oak barrels that we use and the distillation process and the oxygenation process all make it a wonderfully beautiful product to taste excellent, excellent. by the way one quick little note if i may just a self a selfish plug um saturday night the 10th Chris Young, country music superstar, is going to be announcing globally that he's going to be our partner with Tequila Comisario and joining our family. So we're very excited about that. And I'm glad. I'm glad you brought that up because I wasn't sure you were allowed to mention that just yeah. yet, since it is yeah. this Saturday. So mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Chris Young uh, again is the uh, is, I don't want to say spokesman, but he's endorsing the product. The brand ambassador. For brand us. ambassador yeah. for the product. That's excellent. He can slap my hand later on if he wants. To. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, we're going to sign off here right now. This is Business Pulse Talk Radio. I'm your host, Michael Brett. We've enjoyed being with you today. And again, uh, Luis Cota from Elite Beverage International is the president of Elite Beverage International and their flagship product, Tequila Commissario. This is Business Pulse Talk Radio. I'm your host, Mike Brett. We'll see you next week on the radio.